I was really impressed with all of the introductions this morning, and it's, it's really an honor and a pleasure to speak to such a group who's so passionate about seeds. So it's my pleasure today to talk uh, about the Open Source Seed Initiative. And I'm going to do it three ways. I'm going to first talk about the problem, or at least the problem as I see it. And then I'm going to talk about OSSI, the Open Source Seed Initiative, and then try to identify how it is that OSSI addresses the problems. And I'll try to do that in 20 minutes. And so in talking about the problem, what I've put up here is four different types of seeds. We have some hybrid maize, some hybrid corn. We have some soybeans. Bottom left corner are some pinto beans. And then a little bit of lettuce seed to represent perhaps the smaller vegetable growers. So what I'm going to do is look at what the problem might be by examining what sort of freedoms we might have to operate with those seeds over time, how that's changed. And when I think of the sort of freedoms that might have changed over a period of time, these are the things I'm thinking about. Our freedom to save, don't I use the word freedom a lot? I must be from the States, right? <laughs> what, a <st> <laughs> what a stereotype. What a stereotype. Also to replant seed, to sell seed, and here I'm thinking not so much as, say, a certified seed grower, but the ability to, say, brown bag or sell Canada number one, or to exchange with my neighbor, or to barter, those sort of things. And then the fourth one that's really important to me as a plant breeder is to use as a parent for breeding with new varieties. And I have to say this can also be important to a room like this of people who save seed because the act of saving seed, as Ann talked about over time, as we save and we replant, we are, in a sense, breeding. So it is not only a matter of interest for those who are professional breeders, but uh, those who save their own seed in any sort of form. So shift of freedoms. And I'm going to start. Uh, so I've got a table here where across the top I've got our four crops, and then down uh, the axis here, I've got these freedoms to sell, uh, to save, replant, sell, and to breed. And so I've done this grid with stoplight colors, so green, free, uh, go, and yellow, caution, and red, stop. And so back in 1980, now this was 35 years ago, many of you uh, would not be able to answer this, would you? Uh, because you're not 35. But this goes back to the this goes back to the start of my career, so it is something that I'm quite aware of. And the fr it was the Wild West. You could do pretty much what you wanted with seed. It was prior to the adoption of plant breeders' rights in 1990, as Ann mentioned. And so uh, the field is quite green. Uh, with most of these crops, you could essentially do what you want. You acquire the seed. You have freedom to operate. Now, I have under corn some caution because biologically it doesn't make sense to do many of these things. You could do it. There, there weren't legal restrictions, but biologically it does not make a lot of sense to save hybrid seed or to replant it because the seed will have gone through one generation of inbreeding. The, the performance would drop. And so biologically it didn't make sense, so I made it yellow. But one could do that, and in fact, you certainly could take that seed and do some breeding if you wanted, and frankly, that's what was done a lot in those days in breeding corn. Now, fast forward uh, 15 years, and we are now in 1995, and we are now in an era where we do have plant, bre plant breeders' rights in Canada. Uh, and so what has changed here is really on the selling side. What plant breeders' rights governs primarily is the the rights to propagate, the rights to distribute and propagate, and those stay then with the plant breeder's rights holder, with the breeder or the breeder's agent, and the breeder or their agent can assign these rights to others, but it's all around propagation of protected materials. And so what has changed with the introduction, introduction of plant breeder's rights, really it hasn't affected our ability to, to save or to replant, that's still entrenched in the farmer's privilege within plant breeders' rights, 
but uh, sell selling is affected, and, and not only selling a variety by name, uh, but also the brown bagging also was starting to be quashed quite a bit more. Uh, but the breeder's privilege is still there, and so for research and breeding, you could still do it. So the field is still green with starting to get some red in it. But if we look at now, so I'm looking at now as being 2015, 35 years after the start, what we see is a lot more red here in that where we have crops like uh, corn and soybeans, we really have red fields right on through. And why is that? It's because, well, at least in the US, we're looking at 90, 95% of the crop in corn and soybeans, even higher in soybeans, is genetically modified. And along with the genetic modification then, we have, U so I have post-UP, what I mean there is utility patents. So in the States anyway, we have utility patents on not just the gene, but on, on, the, on the, uh, uh, the novel trait as well. Uh, also, BT stands for bag tags, shrink wrap tags, uh, the, the use of um, uh, material transfer uh, agreements. So we have uh, patent law as well as contract law that is not allowing us anymore with these crops anyway to save or replant, certainly not to sell, but also to breed. And so it's quite alarming to a breeder, professional otherwise, that the claims that are made, for instance, on a utility patent say you can't do that. So things have really changed. And the reason I put these up and used the colors I did is I just wanted to show the sequence of going from rather green fields to being red. And so this is what I'm trying to introduce as, as the problem, is that our freedoms to operate once we've acquired the seed are being constrained. And we certainly can see it in the larger commodity <coughs> crops, but it's also starting to find its way into some other materials. For instance, I have a yellow field for the lettuces because we are finding utility patents, for instance, in lettuces. And not just for gene constructs either, but for novel traits such as red colors right to the core of the lettuce is starting to be patented. So the, the, the things are changing quite a bit. All right, so the point of this though, it, it, doesn't this reward innovation? Isn't tying this up and making sure we have these contracts, isn't this resulting in a flow of funds back to the breeders so they can continue to innovate. And isn't this reinvigorating seed production? And I would say if you are in that system uh, where, where you are growing commodity crops on intensive scales, then yes, this is, a fan, this is an amazing, I won't say fantastic, it's an amazingly well integrated uh, system. So for yes, for commodity crops grown in industrial production systems, using varieties that are produced by industrial breeders. Yes, this system works well, and it seems to be fine-tuned to that. But for those of us in this room who are not working within that s intensive system, or working in, margin, in the margins of that system, or for those of, of us who are in a parallel universe in terms of what we are doing, then no. For local, organic, regionally adapted, climate, climate responsive, culturally appropriate, culinary forward, especially artisan bread crops, this is not working. And so that's why I want to talk to you about other approaches. So is there another way? Is there a way that parallel universe in terms of seed distribution and release that maintains farmers and gardeners freedom to save, replant, and sell and also allows the breeder the opportunity to continue to breed. And the third piece that I want to put in here as a little bit of a tweak is, and is there a way that we can have an ever enlarging pool of this material? So it's not just static, a few marginal lines, but over the years, this pool continues to grow until it starts to rival what we see as the pool of germplasm available to industrial breeding. So can we do that? And that's where it brings me to OSSI. OSSI stands for the Open Source Seed Initiative. And what it is, is a way to release and exchange seed that emphasizes sharing. Now that's a parallel universe, isn't it? But it's one that we operate in. So it ensures 
that the seed will remain free of patents, of licenses, of contracts that restrict our ability to save or to replant or to sell or to work in breeding. So this is what Aussie is trying to do is create that universe and also we feel we have an educational mission. Uh, not, not that I need to preach to you about this but there are a lot of people, a lot of eaters, uh, a lot of enjoyers of food who do not realize the sort of legal encumbrances that there are on seed and who might otherwise consider seed to be a natural resource and aren't aware of those efforts and those things that are existing now to curtail freedom to operate once seed is acquired. So we feel we have an educational mission as well. The two principles that are important, and this is where, as Jane was correct, I. I started discovering these things through my 13-year-old son at the time who was interested in Linux. Back in the day, Linux was, was more of an experimenter's operating system. And here I had this kid who was trying to get it installed, basically ruining one of my computers because these things didn't work very well at the time. But it got me involved in what is open, soft, open source software? What is general public license? And it was at the same time that I was recognizing some of those losses of freedoms that I was showing on the previous pages. And so it just kind of came together in some of these ideas. In what way is this open source? In what sense is Aussie Seed open source? It's open source in that it can be freely used once it's acquired. It doesn't mean that it's free of cost. So some people say free not as in beer, uh, but as in freedom to operate. And so. It's not free of cost, seed is still bought and sold, but once it's acquired, you have freedom to operate with this seed. This idea of copyleft is a little different. It's, it's a funny word, copyleft. I, it's not my favorite one, but the principle is extremely important, and that is that once you acquire this material, any derivatives from that, whether it's new seed that you produce or whether it's products of plant breeding, also must be distributed with the same freedoms as the original seed. This is new, and this is really at the core of Aussie. It means that once a seed is Aussie, whether it is resold or whether you use it in breeding, the new material that comes from it is also Aussie, and it maintains those freedoms. Remember that ever-enlarging pool of germplasm? This is how it happens, and some of this, some people have called this the virality, the virus that's in this material, again, kind of a computer idea, uh, that once Aussie is in material, it stays in it forever. So some also say who aren't really comfortable with this idea, are, it's sharing, but it's, it's enforcing sharing. It's requiring people to share. And we say, yes, this is how the seed is protected and allowed, we allow uh, to, it to maintain its freedom. Uh, and so I just wanted to reinforce down here the idea that it's not just the same seed as what you received, but also covers material that you breed. So that's the open source and the copy left. Now, we spent a year in Aussie trying to develop a legal contract, a license that enforced sharing. And we worked with our lawyers to do this and ended up with three different Aussie licenses depending upon whether it was completely free or kind of free or had, you know. And we had, at the end of the day, we sat back very proud of ourselves at this 12-page document of fine print that rivaled anything that you could come out of Monsanto, to use the M word again. And so we looked at that page after a while and looked at ourselves and said, what are we doing? We're, we're, we're in a way, duplicating uh, the same sort of documents, but substituting the word can for can't. And at the end of the day, for if, if we wanted to enforce this, we had to have every time we transferred seed, someone would have to sign a form saying, I understand this license. The ethic was just not right there. And so we said, we're going to step back from making something ironclad, legally enforceable. It can be done, but it isn't right. And we stepped back and said, instead, we're going to go with a morally, ethically enforceable approach. And so we came up with a very simple pledge, if you will, 
Critics of Aussie will say it's not enforceable. And we say it's not enforceable in the, in the uh, courtroom, and that's not where we want to be on this. We essentially want to be in people's heads and hearts on this. And so here is the Aussie pledge. It says, you are free to use these Aussie seeds in any way you choose. And then the pledge part is, in return, you pledge not to restrict others' use of these seeds or their derivatives by patents, licenses, or other means, and to include this pledge, so that others know what's going on with the seed, to include this pledge with any transfer of these seeds. So that's what the, thank you, that's what the Aussie pledge says. So crazy idea who came up with it. The reason that I wanted to show that this is us in, in 2012 at the University of Minnesota having, actually it was the meeting where we came up with the name. We had started earlier than this, but there we are. It's another grassroots organization like this. So if we look at ourselves, uh, actually this group is larger, but it's a small group that includes uh, breeders and uh, seed producers and seed catalog owners, uh, NGOs, uh, representatives of the global south. So it's a group of people who all had a love of seed and wanted to maintain open access. So it's, a fo it's folks like us. So what have we done? Is this just a, a hollow attempt? Well, actually, no. After that year of getting not too far with our licenses, we spent a year doing that, trying to come up with something we later threw out. In 2014, we said, it's time, folks. We need to come out with seed. And so on April 7th uh, of this past year, we had our first release of seed. There are 37 varieties uh, here that are Aussie that have been contributed to the Aussie cause, mostly by the breeders who are part of the organization. But it's a very impressive range from full pint barley that comes out of Pat Hayes' program uh, out west, carrots, celery, crest kale, lettuce, squash, quinoa, peppers, mustard, zucchini, a lot of um, vegetable crops as well. So we do have, we have had a release. And along with that release, we had an opportunity then to put up a website. We can show the various parts of the world where there's a, certainly a lot of interest in North America, in Europe, but also distributions that happened in Asia and in Australia. And uh, with that, we've had the opportunity to do some uh, press appearances as well. Perhaps you know some of these folks. This is Jack Kloppenberg. Uh, who's here stirring the pot with his seed advocacy, and um, Irwin Goldman, who's, who keeps a steady beat and keeps us moving forward. But the biggest reason that I wanted to show these pictures is because this is a, uh, a shot of Tom Stern from High Mowing Seed, one of our uh, members, speaking with a group of students, a group of plant breeding students who get together annually and the point I want to make here is that these are the breeders of the future. Some will go on to be professional breeders in large organizations. Uh, others will be working toward organic seed. But the point is we're starting to get the word out uh, through respected people like Tom to those who are going to be the plant breeders in the future. So what's next? Uh, April 2015 is just around the corner and we're going to do another release. Uh, so we are just about at the stage to be soliciting materials that we can include in this release. And because we're going to start including breeders who are outside that table that you saw uh, earlier, we have to be able to get, be very clear on what sort of materials are appropriate for Aussie. And it's kind of like these issues around uh, UPOV, what is, what is essentially derived and what is new and and uh, uh, possibly put into this. But basically, we're looking for unique materials, new materials. We're building databases. If you're interested in Aussie seed as a grower, we need to be able to make sure you know who offers this. And at the same time, we're working with seed companies to have them label this material, kind of like Rainforest Alliance on coffee, uh, so that they see it as not just some extra thing that a well-meaning group wants to do, but something that growers want. So if you end up talking to a seed company, you can say, are you selling any Aussie seed? And they'll go, what? Perfect opportunity to let them know what it is and for us to be able to have some influence. And then build awareness and collaboration. So at the end of the day, my, my role here is to try to have you leave with an idea of what Aussie is. And so what is it? It's a system that maintains freedom to save, replant, and sell. That's the open source piece. 
And it's also a system that maintains breeders' freedom to breed, and that's the copyleft piece. And finally, an ever-enlarging pool of varieties, so it's not static, but it becomes a highly desirable parallel universe in which we all want to exist. Thanks very much for letting me explain that. <laughs>